Around these fires, history and story shall meet. We shall talk of things many consider to be forgotten, and we shall reclaim them with our voices. Around these fires is where we give voice to the lost and shed light on things that were always meant to shine. Around these fires, we will not listen to the dry words of dispassionate historians, but we will instead speak of historic passions and the people and things they inspired. Around these fires you will hear the Anansi Chronicles. Before European ships landed on the shores of the Caribbean and the Atlantic, before the people known by many names including Arawak, Carib, Cherokee, Bukayan, Apache, and Navajo, before they had their civilizations, thousands of years old, destroyed by invaders, before the ancient peoples on the African continent were raped and pillaged by these same ships, or resources and their people taken across the sea, before all of that, there was the Mali Empire. Founded in the 13th century by King Sundiata Keita, also known as the Lion King, in West Africa, it was one of the greatest empires of all time. The Mali Empire reigned for 400 years, and at its height was the richest state in the 14th century world. Most notably, its city of Timbuktu was a hub of scholarship. People came from far and wide to study, among other things, philosophy, astronomy, and mathematics, making discoveries and advancements long before their European counterparts. The leaders of Mali were called Mansa. The most famous of these was Kankan Musa, Mansa Musa I. He is perhaps most notable for taking a pilgrimage to Mecca, during which he gave away so much money that he created temporary inflation in the places that he passed through. Before Mansa Musa, however, there was Mansa Abu Bakr II. Very little is known about Mansa Abu Bakr II. In fact, his legend comes to us as a story within another story. A tale told by Mansa Musa in 1324 to an Egyptian about his eccentric predecessor. It is inside of this tale that history ends and our story begins. The crowd of midnight faces stared stonily at the single ship that drifted into the arbor. Their many-colored garments flapped gently in the cool breeze. In the distance, a single boat separated itself from the large ship and began drifting towards them. At the head of this congregation of red, green, yellow, and blue cloth stood Mansa Abu Bakar II. His lean frame was almost completely hidden beneath the silk robes. His fierce black eyes locked on the small rowboat as its occupant fought against the current and slowly moved closer to the shore. Because Mansa did not speak, the gathering of over 100 people stood quietly underneath the cloud-filled sky and everybody waited. Finally, the boat reached land and a tall muscular man jumped out and pushed it further up onto the beach. He took a moment to collect himself, and then began to walk towards the spectators. The guard's broad swords blocked his path when he was close enough, and the man fell to the sand, prostrating himself before his mansa. Abu Bakr took a step forward, and the four large guards who flanked him on each side followed in unison. He signaled for them to lower their swords with a flick of his wrist. Without lifting his head, the man told Mansa of his journey. He had been one captain among a hundred, each put in charge of a ship. They had tried to fulfill the orders of the Mansa, who he addressed as Sultan, and had indeed sailed further than any map in the university. They had seen some small islands, but nothing worthy of the Sultan's attention. And then, they had discovered a vast swirling current in the middle of the ocean. The pull of this thing was so strong that it swallowed 99 of their ships, and it was only by the grace of Allah 
and the skill of his sailors that this one ship had been able to return to Mali. The captain told Mansa that he returned in shame, but he dared not try to brave the ocean again. Mansa listened and reflected. His guards waited for him to call for the man's head, their large hands gripping the golden hilts of their swords. But instead he ordered the captain to rise and told them to dock his ship properly and when he was done, come and eat at the palace. Then he turned and left, the wave of people following behind him, muttering in low, curious voices to themselves. For weeks, Mansa met with the captain and the other sailors. They gave information to his finest cartographers, who were by extension the finest cartographers in the world. His scribes collected their thoughts, and his artists drew pictures of all the strange things they had seen. The records of the sailors' words covered the floor of the many rooms in the many-roomed palace. Then, the Mansa sent them all away. He spent many more days poring over the papers and speaking with his advisors. They told him to abandon his search for land on the other side of the ocean, that theirs was the only world that was, but Mansa could not believe it. He had read all the books in the great library and spoken to all the scholars. He knew, of course, about the white men living in huts in the vast wilderness of Europe. And he also knew of other lands with emperors and strange codes of honor. But still to him, the world seemed too small. As if this was not all there could be. As if there had to be something more. Somehow, the deputy already knew why he had been summoned. He was a shrewd, observant man who had spent many years in the service of Mansa Bakar. He had seen the distant look return to the Sultan's eyes time and time again. He knew that great men were never satisfied with their greatness, and that even here, at the height of human civilization, the Mansa wanted more. The deputy performed the ceremonial bow and waited as Abu Bakr sent away the guards. Then he relaxed. Between them there was no ceremony. They had worked together for a long time, trying to manage the pitfalls that can come with the kind of wealth that Mali had amassed. The two men sat down at a large wooden table, the afternoon sun making their dark skin shine. Mansa poured them both goblets of wine, and then they sipped them and watched as the golden sunlight bathed the greatest city on earth in an almost ethereal glow. Finally, when the sun had disappeared and the sky was full of lamplight, Mansa told the deputy why he had sent for him. The Atlantic Ocean was vast, but he was certain there was more on the other side. He knew that his advisors thought he was foolish, but the future of Mali depended on expansion. The deputy would never dare interrupt the Mansa in public, but they were alone, so he cut him off to tell him they would expand into the known world. They had wealth already, enough to bring God and civilization, even to the dark places on the European continent. But Mansa Bakar had just shook his head. That would only bring conflict and war. War that they could survive, of course, but he did not want to be known as the one who brought it to Mali. He wanted to seek out a new world, a place where no one had ever set foot. He wanted to seek out? The deputy was shocked. The Mansa was certainly not suggesting that the leader of the greatest city on earth should go out in search of strange lands. Mansa Bakar was indeed suggesting that. He trusted his advisors and he trusted the deputy. But he did not trust himself to be the great leader that Mali deserved as long as he spent his days thinking about the other side of the ocean. Then, the deputy suggested that they could scour the world for the finest sailors and the finest ships. There was no need for the Mansa to go himself. But the Mansa said, they would find the finest sailors and the finest ships, but he suspected they would not have to look far 
because this was after all Mali, the greatest kingdom that had ever existed. He would take another 100 ships and they would use what they had learned from the captain and the sailors of the one ship that came back to go even further. No, he would not take 100 ships. The deputy had spoken with such ferocity that Mansa Bakar had raised an eyebrow. He would not take 100 ships, the deputy had declared again. He was the leader of the greatest city in the world, the greatest kingdom that had ever existed. He would take 3,000 ships and an army of sailors and warriors to protect him. Mansa Bakar had smiled at that and nodded in agreement. They would begin the preparations immediately because he wanted to set sail before the cold winds came. So they prepared, and Mansa Bakar was right. They found all they needed in the ports of Mali, the finest sailors, the best ships, and the best shipmakers to make them more ships. In only a few months, the waters around Mali were full of ships and sailors and supplies. The cost of preparing such a fleet for such a journey would have bankrupted any other kingdom. But as Mansa listened to the money counters on the night before he departed, he realized he had not even made a dent in his fortune. Once again, the deputy sat next to him at the large wooden table, sipping wine and looking out at the city, still bustling with preparations for tomorrow. The deputy would rule in Mansa Bakar's stead. He would have full access to his wealth, which when coupled with the deputy's already sizable family fortune, far surpassed anything that any human or kingdom had ever collected before. The deputy had of course anticipated this, but it also made him uncomfortable. He did not regularly think about money, but the kind of fortune he was being placed in charge of was enough to even make someone as capable of him nervous. Tonight, they were not alone. So he only nodded solemnly and deferentially as Mansa Bakar gave him the instructions that were already being carefully copied down by the scribes. The deputy would rule until Mansa returned. However, if he did not return in a year, then the deputy would assume he would never come back and would take the title of Mansa for himself. To the deputy, whose last name was Musa, the idea of being Mansa Musa both frightened him and sounded like the siren call of destiny. Still, he solemnly signed the papers that were presented, and when the business was done and the scribe was finally sent away, the two men spoke of the past and Mali's great future. It was as if all of Mali came to watch the ships of Mansa Abu Bakar sail off into the horizon. There were so many ships in the water that it took several days before the last sail disappeared from view. Mansa Bakar's ship was at the head of the fleet. His cabin was next to the captain's, and he spent his days reviewing the records he had copied from the sailors who brought the story of the strong current. His nights, he spent watching the dark blue of the horizon and listening to the splash of the ships moving along on all sides of him. After being at sea for three weeks, they found the great current that had destroyed the first fleet of 100 ships. It was exactly where Mansa's scholars had predicted it would be. And as they suspected, it was a large whirlpool that could be avoided by simply sailing out of its pull. It was clear, however, how they had lost 99 ships here before. The whirlpool was deceptively large, and even though it was only violent at its center, ships caught in its outer bands were still unable to escape it. The fleet lost 50 of their own ships before they found a safe path around the whirling, howling mass of water and wind. Then another four weeks passed, and now they were outside of the knowledge of any men, so their maps were useless and the water around them was full of strange creatures. Mansa Abu Bakar and his ships tracked a westward path. Abu Bakar learned quickly 
and soon he was as capable a captain as the captain of the ship that carried him. And that was, of course, the finest captain in the known world. These citizens of Mali and their leader sailed off into uncertainty and the terrifying blue by day, black by night of the unknown. They prayed to Allah for guidance and they wrapped their heads in cloth to shield their dark skin from a sun more cruel than any they had ever known. They were, however, not hungry or uncomfortable because their benefactor had ensured they had enough to survive at sea for a very long time. Some of them dreamed of Mali with its pyramids, fine buildings, and beautiful ebony women. But Abu Bakr only dreamed of what lay before them, of the unexplored lands across the wide Atlantic and the things he would see. Every day, Mansa Bakar would stare out into the horizon for so long that sometimes his eyes burned forcing him to finally retreat to his lushly decorated and mostly unused cabin. It was during one such forced return to his cabin that he heard the lookout's cry of land. By now he had been at sea long enough to abandon all ceremony, so he rushed out of his cabin without bothering to don any of the royal garments, and he pushed himself alongside some of the sailors to look. In the distance, he could see the island. It was larger than anything they had sometimes passed on their way. His eyes traveled over the green and the mountains that rose into the clouds. Unlike the small pieces of land in the middle of the ocean they had passed, this place was alive. He could see the birds descending from treetops and the way that the branches and leaves rustled under the passage of land animals. Abu Bakr had indeed found the place at the end of the ocean. He stared in amazement at the white sands at the beaches and then he pointed, his mouth hanging open. The sailors who were all staring wide-eyed at the strange new world soon began to notice it too. On the beach, staring back at them, were people. Nobody knows exactly what happened to Abu Bakr. Some stipulate that he died at sea. Still others believe he made the journey across the Atlantic and possibly landed somewhere in the Caribbean. It is, however, generally accepted that almost 100 years before Columbus set sail, an African leader of immense wealth believed that there was something at the other end of the ocean, and he set sail to find it. This story is important because it helps to better place black people in the proper historical context. So next time, when I tell you a story about 1492, you will understand that was not the beginning of our story, no more than it was the beginning of the stories for these places, with their legacy stretching back thousands of years. Fear warning though, don't come back expecting to hear the story of Columbus, because that is not what I will tell you. No, next time I will tell you the legend of another black adventurer who arrived in the Caribbean in 1492, piloting one of Christopher Columbus's ships. Thank you for visiting our fire and listening to the Anansi Chronicles. There are many other stories to tell, and I hope you will choose to come back. You can check out the show notes for links to sources about the histories that we discussed today. If you enjoy these stories, then please help spread the word by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or on YouTube and telling your friends about us. You can also choose to support this project financially by using the links in the show notes. If you just want to say hello, then send an email to anansipod at gmail.com. The Anansi Chronicles is a Precious Metals production.